Welcome to day three. Um, so day three is, uh, is, is hump day, it's middle day. Um, so basically what we try to do on, on, uh, on day three, and I apologize because a, a lot of this can be uh, repetitive for some people, is in the middle of the week on day three, when we do this, we usually cover some fundamental core uh, programming skills, okay? Uh, in our case, we chose to use Java for this training. So we are going to look at um, an introduction to Java um, and some, some basic Java. The reason that we do this is that, well, a lot of you may or may not, or, or may have an understanding of Java. We get new teams uh, who don't know any um, Java at all, don't know where to start um, and so on. Uh, not a lot of PowerPoint uh, presentation for this because our online docs um, take you through quite a bit of um, introductory Java. And, you know, we actually have probably about another 8,000 pages on the Java documents. Uh, but the nice thing about it is that it is a widely used language. Uh, it's taught in 80% of the classes we find um, in most schools. We, we've actually done surveys, and, and that was one of the reasons why we, we had initially chosen uh, to start and do the training with Java. So. Today may not take a full three hours um, because you know we don't have you here in the room with us. Uh, so we don't know what exercises that you wanna do or what we're gonna give. And to be quite honest, we could start you on Java and we could just give you an exercise and you can sit there um, at your own location and, and do that for a couple of hours, right? There is a lot of stuff out there on Java. Um, if you're interested in material, uh, send us a note we can send you a few links to some pages that are, are recommended that you could sign up for uh, online classes in Java uh, as a good introduction. What, what we tend to do in order to um, simplify things and keep it separate from the VS Code installation, which is our development platform that we use uh, with WPI Lib for World Skills, is that when we're running uh, courseware or teaching um, basic Java, what we tend to use is we tend to use um, NetBeans. Now, friend, uh, James had sent you out a link, I believe, on Monday uh, to download and install uh, NetBeans. Okay, I uh, will cover that. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it, it sets up and it installs a little bit simpler um, than VS Code. It has a little bit less overhead than, than using uh, VS Code. So from a learning standpoint, uh, it, it works quite well. There's also some inherent functionality built into NetBeans uh, where it looks at some automatic error correction and it gives you some nice tips and tricks. So when you're learning Java, it's a great tool uh, to get you going and to get you started you know, as we, as we move on to world skills. So we'll do um, some few basic Java exercises today. You know, we'll talk about uh, certain things that, uh, that you can do or cannot do. Uh, and what we'll probably do after that is maybe get started on a, on a sample ro robot project. Um, I'm not quite sure what James wants to look at and, uh, and do today with you uh, from that standpoint, you know, but just to get you prepared um, fully for tomorrow where we sit down and what we do tomorrow is we go through each core individual functionality of the robot project um, using each sensor, driving a motor, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, just to get you used to some basic input and output um, and coding. So, you know, I also uh, feel free if you wish to come back and, uh, and talk about the training and say, hey, this is what I use uh, when I teach basic Java and I think it's great. And, you know, it's a, it's a community, it's a world skills community. And we like to, um, you know, provide information to everybody uh, and share information for everybody. Uh, everybody programs a little bit differently. Everybody teaches it a little bit differently. So, you know, why not uh, help everybody out going forward when we're going to look at it, right? Um, we might do a little bit of review today uh, as well, just on the VMX um, and the wiring. Uh, don't worry that much about it. I promised you that I would put some wiring uh, diagrams up for you yesterday, but, but we decided that we'd integrate them into tomorrow morning's uh, presentation. So we've taken all of the pictures and we're documenting it and we'll, we'll talk about each one just so that we can go back and get a little bit more hands on tomorrow. Um, so it's not all uh, complete coding. All right. 
So with that, I'll uh, pass you over to James, I think as a reference, what he's gonna do, because we like to keep uh, easy reference materials for you, is he's gonna look at Java and he's going to uh, look at it uh, using our World Skills docs. Uh, like I said, if you're interested in more stuff, um, I have more, I haven't completely proofread it yet. So if you ask me for it and I send it to you, there's little spelling mistakes or things in it, uh, you know, you can proofread it for me and, uh, and give that back to me. All right, so if you want to get going, I guess, I think you're going to start with a little bit of uh, NetBeans installation, right? No, no, a bit of theory and then move into it. A little bit of theory and then we're going to move into it. So uh, everybody stay awake and everybody pay attention. <laughs> So today we're going to start with the Java curriculum that is on our docs page. If you'd like to follow along at home, you can go to docs.wsr.studica.com. Okay. And now if you go down to Java curriculum, you can see there's some units here that you can go through. Not all the units are completed yet as we have so if I put the curriculum on a back page as we've been focusing on other sections of the docs page to get you up and going right away. But we're gonna start with the introduction to programming. We can skip the introduction as it doesn't explain much for the average user. So if you see here inside the lesson, we have uh, sub lessons as part of the lesson. So we'll start with the Java language. So Java was invented in 1991 by Sun Microsystems, which was now being bought out by Oracle. And Oracle maintains Java along with a whole bunch of other things. Um, so Java was originally created by James Gosling, which some people consider the father of Java. However, He's not that active with the project anymore. Uh, what's nice about Java is that it can run on any system as long as it has the JRE. And all Java code is the same, no matter what program or device that it's been running on, it's the same code that's just executed by the JRE and adapted for that platform. So Java has five major sections. There's the language spec, the API, the JDK, the JRE, and the JVM. So the language spec is the actual Java programming language. This is the syntax, the semantics, and everything that relates to the language. If we look at the Java language spec, if we go to it, here you have the different versions of Java. So just recently released was Java 15. And you can see the specs for that. Then you have 14, 13, 12. Currently, the most available version of Java is Java 11. That is what we use along with what the VS Code will be using is Java 11. So if you wanted to look at the specs for Java 11, this is where you would go. That's good. Then you have the API. This is the application program interface. This is the predefined classes and interfaces used when you are creating a Java program. You can also have a look at the API itself when you click here and inside of oh, Inside here, you have the uh, whole API of everything that's in the base Java language. You have the JDK. The JDK is required for when you actually program Java, as this is your compiler and everything that the language looks for when you're creating the code. The JRE is the runtime environment. This allows you to actually execute the code with the JVM. Uh, the JVM is the virtual machine that actually runs on the device that interprets the, the bytecode and then does what you want to do. The bytecode can be transferred from your phone to your computer to the robot, and it will do exactly the same thing with the same code. Okay. 
connects to move on. So here's a very simple Java program. It's called Hello World. Most programming languages have Hello World as their example start project. And in this case, we're also using Hello World. So one thing to know is when you look at the title of a Java program, it always starts with a cap. This is the basic syntax for a Java file itself must always start with a capital letter. In this case, we're using hello world.java. You can also notice that the hello world matches the class name of hello world. Then inside the program, you have a main function. In Java, they're called methods. So you have a main method here. And then we have a message that will display hello world to the console or wherever your output is. So if we were to run this code, we'd get an output on the console window showing hello world. If we scroll down here, we can break it down line by line. There are eight lines in the program, as you can see, one to eight. So line one is the class identifier. Every Java program needs at least one class to be defined in order to run. Conventionally, every class starts with an uppercase letter, as we said before. So if we look here, line two says this is the opening brace. So each class or method has an opening brace and a closing brace. In this case, we're using the almond method of bracing. So you can see that the opening brace is here. And if we go all the way down in a straight line, we have the closing brace. If we look at the method, which is indented in for easier reading, we have the open brace and the closing brace. What the braces do is tells the compiler that everything between here and here belongs to this class or method. So everything between the brace at two and eight belongs to the class hello world. For this method, everything between four and seven belongs to the method main. So on line three, we have the main definition. This is required in order for the Java program to execute. If there is no main method, the Java JVM will not be able to execute at all. So there are different uh, configurations for the main method, but this is the most basic default and will work no matter what you are. And then line four, we have the opening brace. Line five is just the comment. Comments aren't compiled, so you can put in as much commenting as you want and it doesn't make it to the actual bytecode itself. On line six, we are printing out the statement, hello world, to the console window. So in this case, the most common way to use a printout in Java is system.out.println. This is similar in C++ of using C out. So the system.out.println is the call to print something out on a new line. And then inside the brackets here and the braces, the quotations, you have the actual statement that you want to print. In this case, we are printing a string and a string is just a group of characters. So each character here is grouped up and then will be printed to the console as we can see here. One thing to note is Java requires, uh, do you, I think they're called delimiters. Yes. Yeah. Uh, at the end of each uh, line of code that's not a brace or method function or class, as you can see here. I mean, we talk about it here in the important statement that if you notice there's a semicolon at the end of line six, these are required to end the statement. So each line of code that is a statement as which what this one is requires the delimiter at the end. Right. 
And this is a, the nice thing about you doing your, your initial coding and your initial um, learning of Java in NetBeans. Um, NetBeans is very, very user friendly. Um, so that if you have a syntax error like this, uh, where you forget the delimiter at the end of a, of a required line, it will actually highlight it. And then if you hover over it, it will actually tell you um, what that error is and how you can correct that error. So, you know, before you get deep into VS code, that's why we use NetBeans um, when we're doing an introduction to Java. It's user friendly, it self compiles, and it tells you the errors that you're doing as you are actually doing them and it tries to help you correct them. So if we look here at some more simple programs, in this case, we are adding two more print statements to the uh, program. As you notice, the, the name of the Java file has changed to hello world version two. And if you also notice the class name matches the title. The main is still the same. The first uh, print statement is still the same. However, we have added two more print statements. So as you can see here is we added some more print statements. When we print this out or run it to the console, we can see hello world, we added more print statements. You can also do math in Java. So here we are, we can say system.out, let's do some math. And then we show a string. So if you notice the difference between line seven and eight is that on line seven, we're using print and on line eight, we're using print.line. Well, print line. In this case, also this string is inside quotations where on this output statement, there are no quotations. When you put quotations in, it tells the compiler that I'm printing a uh, string, where in this case, there is no quotations. So it's going to create, it's going to actually uh, calculate what this is, and then output the value of what it is. As so I can go before as to why we, we put print here where it's missing the ln. Print will print the statement here, as we can see, right there, which matches this. And then we have the print line, which adds the value of seven as 10 plus two minus five equals seven. So we have seven. So if you notice here, we have the breakdown where we can say on line eight, the math 10 plus two minus five equals is inside quotations. This identifying as a string and not an expression. However, there are no quotations in this statement. So therefore, it is considered an expression and the compiler will evaluate that expression and then print that statement. And that's it for a simple Java program. So now let, let's look at how a Java program is executed. So if we look back at the simple program, which we have here, we can now see how a Java program is executed. So here is our simple Java programmer, which then goes to the compiler. And then the compiler creates a hello world.class, uh, which is your bytecode. You can then transfer the, transport that bytecode to any platform, which then uses the JRE and JVM to execute this bytecode. If you notice, there are two things required. Well, there's three things required. You need your class file, the JRE, which is the Java library, and the JVM. With these two, the JVM can then execute the class and output it correctly. To call the compiler in the command window, we are going to use Java C which stands for Java compiler in a short form. And we're going to compile the actual file. So when we actually run that command, it will create the hello world.class file if there are no errors. If there are errors, 
it'll spit it out and tell you what the errors are. So here I've actually opened up the byte code to show what it looks like. As you can tell, it's a lot different than the code that we have up here. As this is the byte code that can then be interpreted by any JRE and JVM on any device. So if, when this byte code is run, it will output hello world. Now you can have a look at some byte codes of some really big programs and it gets big and looks very different to what the code actually looks like here. So we won't do the end of lesson exercises as there's some questions about uh, how much you learn. So it's nice for someone that's actually doing it and wants to learn a little bit more about Java, but for our case, we're not gonna go through the end of lesson exercises for the theory. We could, we could put a test up for you if we wanted to and, and make you answer the questions um, in the chat. We should open, see if you can open, you're gonna go over the net beans and so, and, uh, mm -hmm. and see if you can at least open it and take us through a simple program. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna cover that first. Okay. So we're gonna talk about a few good practices and errors in Java. So there are some accepted practices, some optional practices, and in general, it comes to as long as you're happy programming, you're good to go. However, if you have to send your code to someone else, that's where problems come in. So the first example we're looking at is we have everything printed on the same line. So here we have public class, hello world, public static void main, string, args, then comment system.out.printline, hello world. Now, if you look at it, that looks really complicated. You have no idea what's going on. However, when we spread that out over multiple lines and use proper indentation, it is much more readable and understanding of what is going on instead of using a single line of code. The reason why we use indentation that we'll get to later is it cleans up the code and we can tell what belongs to what. Now there are two indentation styles that are popular in programming. There's the KNR style, which is for Kerrigan and Ritchie. And then there's the Allman style, which is after Eric Allman. Uh, I prefer Allman style as I like the opening and closing braces to line up where other people like the KNR style because it compacts the code a little bit more. But I find for beginners in programming, the almond style is definitely what you want to look at as it makes it easier to see what belongs to what and it's easy to trace where the braces are. Now there are benefits and drawbacks to both. However, the main issue is to stay consistent throughout the whole project and not swap between the two because the moment you start swapping between the two, your code starts to become confusing and especially if it needs to be maintained by someone else. So if we look back at the indentation that I was talking about, here is bad indentation as there is no indentation. Everything is all on the left. Now you can't exactly tell what belongs to what. However, if we were to indent certain sections, we can say, oh, this method belongs to this class. And these statements belong to this method. Essentially, after every opening brace, everything in between the opening brace and the closing brace should be indented once. Then we have the method. There's another opening brace and another closing brace. So the statements here should be indented once. And that creates a good program flow. Now in some programs, you could have lots of indentations, which is a good thing, because then we can tell and work backwards to see if there's an error and it makes for easy debugging. So spacing. While it's not necessary, 
it does make it easier to read your code. If we look here, we have a bad spacing example where everything is compact, no space. If we look at good spacing inside the parentheses here, everything is spaced out. So you can see six space times space 10 space modulo space five. It makes it a lot easier to read what's going on compared to just all together like this. Now we have commenting. There are multiple uh, styles of commenting. In general, there's three major ones. So you have a line comment, which does a single line comment. A line comment can be done at the beginning like this, or it can be done after a line of code. One thing to note is after you do the double slash to create a line comment, anything after the double slash will be commented out. For example, if we look at line seven here, we have a double slash, which means this statement will never be compiled by the compiler. Then there is the block comment. A block comment is a slash star, and then it ends with another star slash. Block comments allow you to block comment out a whole block of code. If you're doing debugging or you just want to disable that specific feature in the meantime. So you can see some examples here. So if you want to do it in line comment, you can use a block comment as shown here on line six. It can be used. However, it's probably preferable that you don't use inline comments as you can get into trouble. Here we can show a block comment that's commented out a whole class. Then the last type of commenting is a Java doc commenting. What a Java doc comment does is if you were to send your code over to the Java doc to be for uh, documentation purposes, it looks for the Java doc comment. And then with that Java doc comment, it adds that comment to the code base so that you can document your code better. In this case, you can see a Java doc comment starts with a slash star star, as we can see here. And the nice thing about Java doc comments is that they have special features called tags. And then there are some examples of tabs, tags here. So you have at parameter, at return, at author. So if we had a method, for example, above, we have public static and void main string args. So if we did a Java doc comment above this, our at parameter would be the string arg. So we could say these are arguments passed into the main method. And then there is no return as it's a void. So there won't be a return uh, on a tag. However, the at author, we can say, I can put my name, so I can say at author James. So that means that when we look at the Java doc that I wrote that method. If you wanted to look at all the tags and their usefulness, you can consult the Java talk tag convention. So if we click here, you can see all the different tags, if all these that you can add in. And th there's tons and it makes it really good to understand. So let's look at some simple errors. So you have syntax errors. This is where you've done something that the compiler doesn't like as, or can't compile because something is wrong. Most of the type, times, syntax errors are because of misspelled words, of forgetting the braces, so an opening and closing brace, or forgetting to put the delimiter on a statement. So if we look at the example below, there are three errors when we try and compile this, as shown here. On line six here, it gives us a unclosed string literal, literal error and delimiter expected error. The reason for this is 
because of the first error, the unclosed string literal, it'll just pose all the errors after that. So if we look closely at line six, we can see system.out.println. Here's the first string literal. And then first quotation, sorry. Here's the string. But if you look, there's no closing quotation on the end. Hence the unclosed string literal. So if we were to add this to the end here, it would then start to work. So if we read further on, as the only actual error is on the first one on line six, unclosed string literal. The others are the chain effect of the error. So sometimes when debugging your code, it can be hard as if there are multiple errors, it will be hard to debug where the actual error is. So the, if we added that ending quotation, we can now see that the code will run and print our statements correctly. The next type of error that you have commonly is called a logic error. Logic errors are, to, are supposed to do something, but they end up doing something else. They are common and sometimes can lead to very long, stressful debugging sessions. <laughs> So one of the most comic logic errors is shown below where okay. you have a simple true or false. So I've defined a variable here called X, which is equal to false at the start. Now I say, if X equals false, print X is false. Else, print X is true. So when I run this program, it's gonna output X is true but we define X is false. Now we have to figure out why. And the reason is because if we look here at our comparison in the if statement, there's a single uh, assignment uh, quote equal. Now for comparison, we need to put a double equals and not a single equals because we're not assigning a value to X we want to compare that. So the error here is that we actually need to put a second comparison. So as we can see, if we keep going down, if we added the second equals to create equals equals, and then we run it, we get the successful output x equals false. Then there are runtime errors. Runtime errors only happen when you're actually running the Java code. Some runtime errors are input logical, or some can cause the program to crash and create infinite loops. A simple runtime error is uh, dividing by zero. The compiler won't see it. However, when you run the program, it will crash. So if we were to run this, where we divide one by zero, the console will print out exception in thread main arithmetic exception, divide by zero. The reason for this is when you divide by zero, it was just impossible. The uh, math module in Java will try to keep doing that and eventually it'll just toss an error. Some other runtime errors could be you are running a loop way too fast that your computer or device can't handle it and eventually the computer will freeze or the device will freeze. In which case you won't get a, an error, it will just stop working. So we had some end of lesson exercises here that you can work through on your own if you want as practice where you convert uh, simple things like this one liner to multiple lines the KNR to an almond indentation, spacing out, commenting out certain lines, trying to get tags working, etc. So now let's start with some job. So before we install the JDK, we're going to look, I mean, before we install the IDE NetBean, we're going to look at the JDK itself. 
So to install the JDK, we can head over to the Oracle website and then install it for our OS. One thing to note is that for any JDK that gets installed that's not the most current release, which in this case is JDK 15, you will need an Oracle account to download it because they changed their policies and their everything. So if we were to click on this, it would bring us to the Java SE. And then you can look here, you have the JDKs. I am on a Windows 64 machine, so I would download this. If you're on Mac, you could download this. Linux, you download whichever one you're on. And so forth and so forth. So let's assume I've downloaded it already. And we've actually walked you through the installation process here so that you'd understand. When you run the installation file, it will ask you for admin privileges. And then after that, you can say, okay, let's just walk to the wizard. It's pretty straightforward. It'll install and you're good to go. Sometimes the Java home on your computer in, in the environment is not set correctly. And if it's not set correctly, then you could have some issues. One way to check if your Java home is set before following along in this guide is to open your command. Yeah. If I were to just type Java, I can see all this pop up, which tells me, okay, my Java is working. I can also check what version of Java I have by doing Java dash version. And I'm running 11.07, which we can see is what we downloaded. If you get the following error, Java is not recognized as an internal external command. Even though you just installed it, it's because your Java is not set to the proper path location. So to fix this, I only have the Windows example because I don't have a Mac or a Linux device. So the instructions might be different for that. So we would do WinR and we can run system properties advanced and hit enter. This will open up your system properties where you can go to environment variables. In environment variables, you can then find the path so you could do it for your system variables or your user. It's probably best you do it for the user and not the system variables. And then in the first section, you're going to add, or in user variables, find the path and hit edit. You wanna hit edit, not new. And then you can add in the path. This is the path that I have for my program. Uh, my Java. It might be similar for you. It might be different. It depends on where you install it. So after adding that, if you were on Java like I did, you could then see everything that we saw. And the JDK is now installed and set up correctly on your computer. So now we're going to write a, the simple Java program in Notepad. And then we're going to compile it and then run it. So I've already created the hello world example. So if I were to open it, we can see the hello world here. So public class, hello world, public static void, and everything. And I saved it as hello world.java. You can create this yourself if you want. As you can see here, I just use notepad in the example to create it. And then I save the file as hello world.chop. So to compile the simple Java program, we need to first, in this case, we opened as administrator. However, I don't need to do that on my computer. So I've now navigated to the path that I have my hello world.java located on. 
So now if I run Java C, which is for the compiler, hello world.java, I can then run it. Now there is no output because it compiled fine and nothing's wrong. If we look now at the folder, we can see that it's now created a hello world.class file. This is the bytecode. If we were to run the program, to, so to run a program in Java, we call it Java space hello. We don't add dot Java or dot class as the JVM just requires to know this. We run it and you see in the console output, we have hello world. If we wanted to view the bytecode itself to have a look at what it looks like, we can call Java P dash C hello can't type world dot class. In this case, we would have to put the classes. That's the bytecode. When we run this, we can now see the bytecode itself for that. We can see compiled from hello world dot Java. Here's the class. This is the class, it's code. Here's the men method that we have and then the code that relates to it. Very simple. And that's all I explained here. But it, it can be very hard to create a very big Java program and project in your notepad and then to constantly compile everything using the console window. So what we do is we use something called an IDE, so an integrated development environment. In this case, we're going to use NetBeans. And we're gonna use NetBeans version 11.3, which can be installed when you click here, it brings you to the NetBeans 11.3 installation page. So in here, you have your three installers for Windows, Linux and Mac. Once you've installed the NetBeans, uh, once you've downloaded the NetBeans installation, you can run the installer and you'll see a window like this. So you can see the installation size is not that big, but it can be big. As you can see, it's 681.3 megabytes. And what it's going to install is the base IDE, the Java SE, the Java EE, and then some other. So you can hit next, or you can customize it if you want, if you don't want to install a certain package. So it's very simple, follow the prompts, it's good to go. Once installed, you can then open NetBeans and you will see a prompt come up. It'll say, welcome to the NetBeans IDE plugin installer. We do want to install the following plugins, so we'll hit next which will then install these two plugins and we should be good to go. As once that's all done, the IDE window should look like this and ready to go. So I've now installed Java. Now we need to write some, IDE, some exercise. So now we want to look at how to use the IDE. So using the IDE. Now that the IDE is installed, we want to actually write some Java code and run. In this case, we're going to create a project. So there's two ways to create a project. You can hit file new project. You can hit control shift N or you can click on this icon here, which is highlighted here. This will open up the project creation window. You can choose Java with Maven, Java with Gradle, Java with Ant. And, but in this case, we're going to use Maven and then select the Java application. Once you've done that, there are some options that you can put in there. Uh, we're just gonna use first project and it creates it. You can change your group ID if you wanted to. And then you have your project. You can then add a Java file to your project. 
or you can create a whole new Java file. It's up to you. In this case, we're actually creating a new Java file. We're gonna name it hello world. And then we get the Java file. In there, it creates a whole bunch of code and then we can add the simple Java program and run it. So let's go through that on the actual netbeam.e. So here we have the NetBeans IDE. We're going to create a new project. If we remember, we can click on this icon right here. And then we have Java with Maven, Java application. Next. I'm going to call this World Skill. Okay, I don't need to change anything else. Okay, finish. We can see our project is here along with this project window. So we're going to be editing inside the source package. Here's our package. I'm going to right click new Java class. We're going to call the class hello world skill. For robotics is awesome. Mm -hmm. So if we notice now, it's created the first, it's added a base license header along with our method. So this license header, you can change to be whatever you want. This is just the template. The package on line six here matches this package here. And then we have the method. So if you notice the method I mean, sorry, we have the main class. If you notice, there's nothing inside the class. There's no main method or anything, which means we need to add it. We can also see that it's added a Java doc comment. As you can see, the slash star star. And then it's also done at, automatically at author James. That's because it's detected that I'm currently the user logged in and I've created code James. Now, by default, it uses um, uh, K and R style for the braces, but I'm going to switch it to almond style. Now we need to add the uh, main method along with any print statement we want. So public static void main string. So here we have the main method now. As we want to call it, static void main string art. So now we have an actual actual executable Java program. However, the program is not going to do anything because there is no statement. So let's add a statement. So we're going to do system dot out dot print line. And let's say Hello, everyone. And if you remember, we have to add the delimiter at the end. And now we have a program that if we run it, it should work. So to run it program in NetBeans, you have, there's the build icon, there's the run project. So if we hit run, it'll compile and run, it. or we can just hit build where it'll just compile it. Let's hit build first. So I'm going to hit build. And you can see in the output window here, it's going to start building the project. And the build succeeded in a total time of 2.61 seconds. I'm now going to run it. It's going to ask me select the main class for execution. In this class, in this case, it's this. So I'm going to select the main class. And then we can see here. Hello, everyone, as we showed here. Now let's show what happens if there's an error. So I'm going to take out the delimiter here. You can see NetBeam itself has already given me an error with the red line underneath saying, hey, delimiter expected. 
Now, if I completely ignore that and I hit the build, you see the build failure. Then it tells me in this file on line 16 on character space 46, which is right here, the delimiter is expected. So I'm like, oh, I need to add my delimiter. And now when I build it, everything's good again. If we were to do that string literal error by commenting out the uh, one quotation, you can see it's also giving us an error. It's already saying the unclosed string literal. But I'm like, I don't believe the IDE. I would have compiled it anyways. Then the compiler tells me, hey, the build failed, unclosed string literal on line 16, character 28. So I'm like, huh, go to line 16, character 28, which is right here, add it. And I'm like, oh, now everything's good again. You can run it. Oh, well, we built it. And it builds. And we can run and you see, hello, everyone. And that's the power that the IDE has, is that we can tell right away that there's an error and we can fix it before we build the project itself. Now, if we go back and we look at one of the errors here, for example, let's look at the logic error. So I'm just gonna copy the insides here and bring it into the project here. Oh, I want, want, there we go. So if we look here, we have we set Boolean x is equal to false. If x equals false, do this. Else, do this. So we can see here there's a warning. It says the branch is never used. So the IDE is already telling us that we have a logic error as such, because it can detect that X equals false and that the comparison is not actually working because we're setting the value to X. Hence why it's telling us this branch never used. If we were to run this program, we would see the X is true statement. However, now if we added that extra comparison, invert if, and we're good to go. As there's, the ID never tells us that there's any more errors, as it's live compiler is telling us we're good to go. So now if we're running this, we now see X is false because the comparison is there correct. If we look at the other example of the runtime error where system not out, where we have to divide by zero. I'm gonna take this all out. System dot out. Another nice thing about the IDE, if we show here, is the IntelliSense will where it will try and finish it for you. which helps if you're trying to figure out what's going on. In this case, we're going to go one by zero. See, now the IDE does not know that we have a runtime error here. As the only way to detect a runtime error is by actually running the code. So we're going to run this. And we see command execution fail. Now, unfortunately, it's not going to tell us why there was a runtime error. Oh, maybe it is. So the, the actual Java compiler is telling us, well, not the compiler, the JVM is telling us of the arithmetic exception divided by zero. And then this is a stack trace, which tries to find where the divide by zero is. 
but essentially the compile uh, the JVMs already told us to, us, but the IDE tries to look even more deeper. In this case, it's world skills line 16. So if we look here, we have line 16. Here's our divide by zero. So now we want to divide by 1.0. Let's do it. Let's do something. Now, if we run the code, we can see that one divided by two is 0 0.5. And we're good. Very simple. So we're not going to take a 15 minute break. Take 15 minutes, yeah. Upon which we will come back and we will switch over to VS code and we will show how to import an example project that we created, how to deploy and connect to the VMX, and yeah. All right, we'll see everybody at 10 minutes uh, past the top of the hour.
Welcome back, everybody. Wake up. Uh, we're all ready to go. We're all excited. Uh, I've only had two cups of coffee this morning, so I'm not as excited as I was yesterday. I think yesterday at this time I was on my fifth super extra large uh, coffee. So a little bit of a brief uh, introduction to Java. Uh, I've been sitting here for the last half hour um, searching for a lot more detailed information that I have somewhere. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, see if I can find that and, and start to, uh, when we give you the recordings for today, try to post just a little bit more information and background uh, information if you uh, are not quite familiar with Java going forward. Um, so what we're going to do is we, we have created some um, example projects for world skills. Um, so as we transition from the introduction to Java, like we said, using the NetBeans IDE, and you can see that when James was working in the NetBeans IDE, for instance, as he forgot a delimiter, it had automatically, um, you know, gone forward and, and given him an error, okay, and tried to get him to correct that before he got into the compiling stage. So when you're learning Java, it's a great tool because it does that type of thing. Whereas now we're going to get into looking at um, VS Code. Uh, VS Code is more of a less friendly, okay, um, because it's more of a text based or text editor based rather than a complete uh, complete IDE. Okay, but each one has its pluses and and uh, and minuses as you work through them. So what he's going to do is he's going to show you where you can get that sample project from, um, how to download the sample project off GitHub, and then also you know how now we would take that sample project and connect it, okay, to the robot control system. Um, we'll do that today so that if you want to mess with that as you're done learning Java and you want to try a few things, and then we will actually review it again tomorrow when we get into doing sample code, for instance, for each one of the sensors, okay, and the devices within the control system. So um, the motors and things like the Sharp IR sensor uh, and so on. So I will pass this back over to Mr. Taylor and away we go. Okay. So first things first is I'm going to show you where to download the example project. So on our GitHub, we created an example projects uh, repository. Right now, I've only uploaded one of the example projects, which is for the training platform here in uh, Java. I haven't created the C++ one yet, but I'm getting to it. So if we go through the projects, you can see there's a folder for that specific project. And then you have the two different code versions. So we have Java, C++. In this case, only the Java project is available. And then you can see the project contents are here. So we're going to uh, download this example project. Download it, you can either clone it locally using Git or you can download as a zip and it will download. And then inside you can find the folder along with its contents. So I'm now going to bring this over to a area where we can use it. So here, we're going to drag the Java project in there. And we now have the project here. Now, we don't, there's no project from VS Code assigned to it. So we have to open up VS Code first. Now, if you remember from the installation of installing VS Code, there is the online installer and the offline installer. Please make sure to use this version of VS Code and not a separate version. So 
All right, I'm just getting VS Code ready. So here we have uh, the VS Code. So we're gonna hit File, Open Folder. This is the easiest way to open a project. We're then going to find this project, which is here, Java. Then we're in the correct folder, so we're gonna hit Select Folder. It'll then run a Gradle build to import and make sure everything is there that should be there. And you can see on the left here, it's now populating the project as it should be. One thing to note is that you have to be connected to the internet when you do a Gradle build uh, for the first time. After that, you can be disconnected from the internet as it does not matter. So now if we look here, we have our Java project. If we go into the source here, we can see all the code related to our trainer. Inside the vendor depths, we can see the code for the Navex, along with the code, I mean, the library for the Titan. Now, of course, you can't actually see the code as it's a JSON, where it just links to the Maven repository that the code is located. And we can explain, we'll, we'll be explaining that later uh, tomorrow and Friday. So let's do a quick overview of the code structure inside VS Code. So the project is here. All the code will be inside your SRC. In this case, we're the Java FRC robot. So if you notice, there's a main.java. The main.java does not have that much code in it, and you should not touch this Java pro code. If you touch this code, you will mess up your robot. So just leave this alone. Don't touch it. Don't even look at it. Just know that it's there. Okay? Top secret. This robot.java is your main class. So in here, you have all the code that's related to your robot and the specific functions and area of the robot. Now, so here we can see the class as we talked about. We can go over robot container later. So in this robot init method, this is the initializer for your robot. So everything that happens in this method will happen when the robot first boots up. So when you hit the power button, this is the code that is run. This robot periodic method, anything that's in here will run every time the robot uh, thread loops, which is about every 20 milliseconds. So every 20 milliseconds, anything that's in here will run. Note that uh, if you have any motor controller code in here, it's not a good idea. So in the robot periodic, you want to have stuff like sensor data, uh, diagnostics, anything you want to push to a live window screen for you to view. It's useful for if you're lining up your robot at the start of a match to have it in the right place and location. Disabled in it is what happens when the robot is disabled. So when you hit the disabled on the command console, this is where it goes first, and we'll run any code in there. Some people like to put the motor stop code in there, but you can just leave it blank. Disabled periodic is anything that will run while the robot is disabled. It's just there for general, but we don't normally put any code in there. You then have autonomous in it. So anything that needs to initialize before you move to autonomous mode on the robot, needs to be placed inside the autonomous initialization. Autonomous periodic is when you're in autonomous mode, anything that will be running autonomously on the robot will be located in that method. 
currently this project is configured for Telia control. So using a controller, in this case, we're using a PS4 controller to drive the robot around. So I don't have anything inside the autonomous method. Then we have the teleop in it, which is any time we are moving to the teleop mode for us to drive the robot around manually. However, I don't need to initialize anything there. And then we have teleop periodic. So anytime anything needs to run during that mode constantly, it'll be inside the periodic function there. There's a test in it. This mode is not normally used, so we can ignore it along with the test periodic. If you want to use the built-in simulation on in VS Code, there's a simulation in it and the simulation periodic. However, only the Navax is currently supported for simulation. The Titan is not currently supported as we haven't gotten to that simulation yet. But it's here to satisfy the internal watchdog of the robot. And that's the main robot, Java. It's very straightforward. Most of the code, as you can see, is not in this Java program, as it's in the robot container and a whole bunch of other commands and subsystems. So now if we look, we have a constant.java. This is where we hold uh, electrical constants and constants that need to be shared between all programs or all of our code in the project. In this case, you can see I have a motor constants and the sensors. And the motor constants relate to the Titan or the servo that's on here. In this case, I have the Titan's CAN ID, which is by default always 42, unless you use the uh, software that we wrote to change the ID. Then you have the motor, which is two. As you remember, the motor is plugged into M2 on the Titan. So our motor is set to two. If the motor was plugged into M3, then we change this to a three, but it's a two right there. Then we have the servo, which is currently hooked up to PWM zero on the VMX. If you were to look at your VMX, PWM0 would actually be the high current DIO channel 12. And we will be going over the different uh, PWM locations and such for it on tomorrow when we do sensors and actuators. Then you have servo C, which is uh, what we define for a continuous servo, which will be on PWM1. And we that is port 13, which is right next to PWM0. And then for sensors, we have the sharp sensor, which is on port zero, which would be A0, so analog port zero, which on the VMX is channel 20. Then we have the ultrasonic sensor. Now the ultrasonic sensor, there are certain pairings that are required. And we'll be going over that again tomorrow in the sensors tutorial. And there is a trigger and an echo pin that we define. Now the constants is just a simple uh, constant, nothing more than no, pretty simple. Now we want to look at uh, robot container. The robot container is basically where everything runs. It holds all the code together and makes sure everything runs correctly. In this case, we have our gamepad defined, the subsystem, which is the motors and everything, and the actual command, which converts the gamepad, which takes the gamepad and the subsystem and combines them together in order to react to an input coming from the controller. So in here, we define our subsystem our game pad, which in this case is called OI, so operator instructions. And then we have the actual container. So we create the new instances of our subsystem and our controller. And then we set 
all of this to our default command, which is drive. Still very straightforward. So what's happening here is we're creating a new subsystem, or well, we're creating a new instance of the subsystem for the training here. We're creating a new instance of the gamepad operator instructors to read the gamepad data. And then we are, are setting the subsystems command to drive, which is our command. So now let's go over what the subsystem, the gamepad, and the commands are. Let's start with the subsystem. Subsystems can be found in the folder subsystems. So we see here we have training.java. So a subsystem is a system on the robot that is for a specific purpose. In this case, training, which is everything related to a device on the training platform. If Derek were to hold up the drive base there. Woo! So in this case, if we were to create another subsystem on an actual robot, we'd have something called the drive train. And that would relate to the motors and encoders for the drive base system. If we then had an object management system, such as a claw, then we'd have a subsystem for that. If we had an elevator on the robot, we'd have a subsystem just for the elevator. If we had a flywheel to shoot something, we'd have a subsystem just for that. So the subsystem breaks the code of each section of your robot into different classes to allow you to better control your robot. As we will see in other examples when posted, you could see more subsystems and everything and how it connects. So let's go through the training.java subsystem. So first we include it as part of our package as we're inside subsystem. Then we have some imports related to the uh, WPI main library. Then we have a Java import. This is a built-in function of Java. As it's a utility, we have to import it and it's not a base something you just call. And then we have our vendor imports. imports. The vendor imports are the third party libraries outside of WPI that are written by a manufacturer. So in this case, we have the internal navx from the vmx and we have the code from uh, stuica for the titan the cobra line sensor and a servo and a continuous servo if we look here here is our class so our class is the training.java class which extends the subsystem base what this is is it handles the registration and constructor for, and provides a more intuitive method for setting the default. Essentially, the subsystem base tells the main Gradle compiler that this code right here is a subsystem. And should it be treated as a subsystem, it's mostly background stuff that we don't need to worry about. And so first we need to create the objects for everything on the training platform. So I'm gonna, I created a section here called motors. If you notice, we wanna keep this private, which means it can't be accessed from an outside area. So in this case, we have the Titan quad motor. So what I'm saying is I have to find a new Titan with a motor. And then we have servo servo. So I've defined a new servo with the name servo. And then I also created a servo continuous object with the name of servo C. Then we have other sensors on board of the training platform. I'm just gonna switch the camera here. Where we have the Cobra, which is at the bottom, named Cobra. We have an ultrasonic sensor at the front here, which we named Sonic. We have an analog input, which is the Sharp. And we have the, the NAVX, which in this case is called ours, 
and then we're going to name it Jaru. Now, the shuffleboard here, which we'll go over when we start showing everything, the shuffleboard is a special widget that allows us to display data to the computer screen. In this case, I'm creating a new tab in shuffleboard, and I'm adding a few outputs, and I'm also grabbing a few inputs from the shuffleboard. In this case, I'm going to use a, a slider which will allow me to control the servo on the training platform based on the value that I slide it to. If we look here, I've set the min and max to zero and 300. This corresponds to the max degrees that the new servo in the collection can do, which is zero to 300 degrees. And then we have a servo speed. So when we set the servo to a continuous mode servo, we can set the speed that the motor spins at. In this case, we have a minus one and a one. So when at minus one, it'll be going full direction, full speed in the counterclockwise direction. And when we go one, it's going full speed in the clockwise direction. And it is variable. So if we go uh, closer to zero, the motor will get slower and slower, and then at zero, will stop. And we'll be showing this all again tomorrow in more depth. Here we have the constructor of the training subclass, I mean subsystem. So we are now creating the instance of each item on the training platform. So if we remember, we have motor, which is a Titan quad object, which is now we're creating a new object, which has parameters. If we hover over Titan quad, we can see the parameters. And in this case, the parameters are the device ID and the motor. In this, so the first parameter is the device ID. And the second one is the motor. If you notice, we are using constants dot Titan ID and constants.motor. If we go back to our constants.java class, we can see we have Titan ID and motor, which are 42 and two. So in training, this will then bring it in and it'll be 42 and two. If we hover over Titan ID, we can see O equals 42 and motor equals two. So what we're doing is we're passing the value of 42 and two into Titan quad. This will then tell the Titan quad library that our Titan is at ID 42 and we are using motor two, which is just now gonna be assigned to motor. If we were to change the motor, we don't have to change this code at all. We just have to go into constants.java and change it. So if we did three and save that file, if we go back to training.java and we hover over motor, before it was two and now it is three. The benefits of this is if you were to electrically change the wiring of your robot, there's only one class that you have to change in order for it to save. And you can edit this without having to go through and edit all the files in your program. Now we have the servo, the servo continues as we set its ports here. We have the sensors. So we have a Cobra the analog input for the sharp sensor, the ultrasonic, the R. In this case, we are using the internal SPI port, which will communicate to the Navex through the VMS. So after the uh, constructor, we go into the accessor method. An accessor method is something that you can be called from the outside of a subsystem to get the value of something or to figure what's going on. In this case, we're going to first do the get cover raw value. If we hover over cover raw value, we can see it says call for the raw ADC value. So the parameters are channel range zero to three. 
which matches what is on the ADC. If we remember, the ADC has four inputs. There's A0, A1, A2, and A3. So if we wanted zero, we choose channel zero, and it will give us back a value between zero and 2047, as the ADC is an 11-bit ADC. One more thing to show is we use the Java doc comment here and to see slash star star. That allows us to put in some values here along with the Java tip. And we can see a practical application now that if we hover over the method, we can see the exact same comment that's listed here because it is now being sent as a Java doc comment. In this case, we're going to say, we're going to return an integer when we call this method and we use the parameter of what channel. It'll then call the internal Cobra, which we set to get the raw value at that channel and return that value to us. If we wanted to read the voltage instead of the raw value, we can then call get Cobra voltage which is the same thing, it has the same channel of zero to three and it'll return a voltage between zero and five volts. However, it'll return a value of zero to 3.3 volts if we use the constructor here and put a value of 3.3F. The reason for this is if our, we set our Cobra to be in 3.3 volts instead of five volts, we'd have to change the reference voltage to have the voltage set correct, in which case we add that value in the constructor. We're going to leave a blank though as our COBRA is set for 5 volts because we want the full range, not just half the range. Then we have get IR distance, which is the sharp sensor. And here we can see the math related to converting the uh, voltage that is given to us from the internal ADC on um, the VMX and then converting that to a distance of centimeters to be read from the sharp iron sensor. In this case, we are going to grab the average voltage. So if I hover over this, it, gets, it shows it returns a scaled sample from the output of the oversample and average engine for this channel. So in this case, we've set the sharp to be uh, connected to port A0, which on the VMX, as we said before, is shown as pin 22. It'll then do the math here and convert the centimeters that it sends out. And we notice we're asking for a double, so it returns a double, which gives us accuracy. Then we have the sonic distance, so the ultrasonic sensor. In this case, we are asking a Boolean metric. What this means is, do we want the value to be in metric or not? So if we put a true into when we call get sonic distance, it'll then return the range in millimeters. If we do not put a true, so if we put a false, it'll return the value in inches. It's just something to put in that if you wanted the value in inches, you could use <laughs> false. If you wanted the value in metric, you can use true. So if we look inside the function, we are sending the ping, which starts, which sends out the, the ping. And then we are listening for the return echo when we call get range or get range inches. We have the timer. Uh, delay in here of, this is five milliseconds. The reason we do this is there needs to be somewhat of a delay between the ping and the echo. It doesn't affect the accuracy at all. It's just there for uh, the real-time module to handle it properly. Then we have something simple. So if we wanted to get the yaw value from the navx, we just call get yaw. If you wanted to reset the yaw, we just call zero yaw. So if we notice now, we switched from an accessor method to a, uh, a mutator method. 
Mutator methods allow us to set values or modify values. In this case, we are setting it to zero. Then we have another mutator here called set servo angle. The set, as you notice, there's no parameters here. This is because the servo angle is being set by our smart dashboard value with us sliding it. However, we have done a overloaded method here. As you can see, this method and this method are of the same name. But if you notice, there's one difference between both of them. This one has no parameters, and this one has a parameter. In this case, double degrees. So if we don't want to use the shuffleboard to set the value of what we want the servo angle to be at, we can call set servo angle and manually put in the range of what angle we want the servo to be at. If we notice here in the parameters, it says degrees, degree to set the servo to. And we have range is zero degrees to 300 degrees, which can be viewed here. And then it will set the angle to that degree. And we have the same thing for the servo speed. So we can either grab the servo speed from the shuffleboard, or we can set it manually uh, by inputting a value. In this case, the range is minus one to one. And then if we wanted to set the speed of the motor, we could call set motor speed, and we'd put in the input of the speed. If you notice here, we say speed, and I added the range of minus one to one, and I put in brackets here, zero of this stuff. So if we hover over here, now I know that when I'm programming, if I type in set motor speed, it'll tell me the range is minus one to one with zero of this stuff. So I know that if I put in zero, the motor will stop. Inside each subsystem, there is a periodic call. So anything in here will be run periodically every 20 milliseconds based on the loop of the robot, which is 20 milliseconds. You can see that if you go to main.java, it used to be in here where you can see the loop and you can also change it. But like I said, forget about that loop. So don't even look at it. So here we are, we're calling set servo angle because we want to update servo based on the shuffleboard input. And then we also want to update our outputs to the shuffleboard so that we can see what our sensors are outputting. In this case, I'm outputting the sharp IR distance, the ultrasonic distance. In this case, if you can see, I'm saying true as I want the distance to be in metric. If I want it to be in imperial, I would change this to false. We want metric, yes. We are a metric country here, and I'm pretty sure most of you are also a metric country. So you'd like your distance in a metric value. I'm also outputting the raw value of the Cobra and the voltage value of the Cobra that is on port zero. So that means whatever is on A to zero will be outputted here. And we're also outputting the yaw value of the navix. And that is the subsystem. It's very simple, gets to the point, and it's done. If you notice, the subsystem itself is just a bunch of accessor and mutator methods. There's no real code going on telling the robot what to do, what not to do, because that's run in your command itself. Now, now let's look at the gamepad before we go to the commands. The gamepad has two sections here. We created a different constants class for the gamepad. So these constants correspond to the PS4 controller. We will be showing you later how to map out these buttons and inputs so that you can have the correct value when you use the controller. I just so if you notice here, our USB port is zero. So what that comes to is that when we plug in the PS4 controller, 
it'll be connected on port zero. If I were to press the X button on the PlayStation controller, the joysticks class will read a value of two being pushed, which corresponds to the X. So what this does is it allows us to map out the controller to be for the code now to interpret it and be used. Close that. So let's open up the actual, so we can basically determine the OI, so operator structure, as a parser class. So in this case, we're gonna import the joystick class, which is part of the WPI. We're going to create the object. And then in the constructor, we're going to initialize the joystick. So what we're saying is the drive pad, which is what we named the joystick, is equal to a new joystick at the port location of drive USB port, which if we remember is zero. So now we're saying the joystick at zero is equal to drive pad. And then here, we're gonna have a whole bunch of accessor methods to access different functions on the controller. So the first four accessor methods are the joystick axes data coming from the controller. So if we look closely, we are gonna read the raw axis coming from the right analog Y. So this is the Y axis on the right analog stick. We're then going to apply a, a digital dead band, which we'll be discussing tomorrow in the centers of PowerPoint and lecture. So in this case, we're going to grab the absolute value of joy, which means if it's negative, it'll become positive. And if it's less than 0.05, that means 5% returns zero. So what we have essentially done is we've created a 5% dead band on the joystick. So plus or minus 5%, it'll be, there's dead band where it will return zero. Otherwise, if it's not in that range, just return what the value of joy is. This is to get rid of any drift that the robot may have if the joystick is not giving, is not perfectly set. And now we have the Y axis for the right analog, the X axis for the right analog. We have the left axis, I mean the Y axis for the left stick and the X axis for the left stick. And we're now switching to triggers. That's a question. Oh, someone wants to know the link. Yeah. So I'll put the link here and then I'll also put the link in the chat. There you go. I put the link in the chat and in that question. Okay, so now going back to the uh, buttons. So in this case, I'm saying I want to return, I want to grab the right drive trigger. So in this case, the trigger is this right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to return the drive pad get raw button. In this case, I'm looking for right trigger. Right trigger is mapped here. So if I look here, right trigger is eight. So when I pull this back and I call this, it'll return a true value as we're looking for a Boolean. If the trigger is not being depressed right now, it'll return a false. And we do the same thing for all the buttons on the control. Very simple. And just like the subsystem, all of this is doing is instead of, it's just accessing, it's creating accessor methods to read what the value is at that specific point in time. So now let's have a look at the command. So here we have one command called drive. What the drive command will do is it will take 
the joystick input data and move the motor. So in this case, we are first off extending the command base. If you remember in the subsystem, we were extending, extending the subsystem base. So again, we're going to bring in subsystem and the gamepad code. So if you notice, we're not creating a new instance of the subsystem and a new instance of the operating structures. We are passing a reference to it from the robot container. Because if you remember in the robot container, we created the new instance. So in drive, we're just saying, we're just referencing that instance. So now we have some local variables that we've, well, local global variables that we've created for this class. So here we're gonna hold the actual joystick inputs. And then we're gonna create a simple ramp. What a ramp does is it allows you to slowly create a smoothed out uh, output for the joysticks. Because when you're driving, when you push the joystick really fast forward, you don't want the robot to all of a sudden just gun it. You want to slowly accelerate up to that max value. And that's what the ramp does. It can also ramp down too. So here's our ramp up constant. Here's our ramp down constant and our delta length. The ramp up and ramp down are currently set at 0.05. However, you can adjust this based on however you feel the robot is moving. We then have the drive uh, constructor. So what we're doing is we're saying this command requires the subsystem of training. So the training subsystem here, training. As you can see, we call it train. That's because if you go all the way at the top here, we reference the training subsystem as train. We are not initializing anything, but there is an initializer here for when you call the command the first time. This will, area here will become beneficial when you're running an autonomous uh, command. As sometimes you get initialized stuff such as zeroing an encoder, uh, setting a motor value, uh, changing a sensor, and that's what you do in this initialized area. The execute method, so we'll Anything that's inside execute method will keep running every robot loop until the command is told to stop. So in this case, we are going to actually grab the joystick data. As you can see, we're grabbing all four axes on the joysticks and putting it to those local variables. We are then using the ramp math, as you can see here, to ramp up and down all four of the axes. And then at the end of all of that, we're then setting the motor speed to our right y axis. So we're not actually using the x axis on the right side or the x axis on the left and the y axis on the left. We're only using the y axis on the right. But we're keeping this code here for when we add more motors, we might want to use more axes. So in this case, we're only setting the one motor as there's only one motor on the training pile. So what will happen is while this command is constantly running, which is when the robot is enabled, it'll keep running this execute over and over and over and over again until the robot is disabled, at which point it will go to end and it'll set the motors to zero or it'll cancel out of the command. But while it's running, it'll keep calling. When it's running, it'll keep coming around. And when it gets here, it'll update the motor speed based on whatever the current value of the input right white axis is. And that's the command. We'll go over a little bit more of the commands when we get to the autonomous section tomorrow or on Friday. Now we're going to show you how to connect to the uh, training platform to deploy and build the project. One thing to notice 
if you look at your build.gradle file, which is very important, I'm gonna open this up in here. This is what tells Gradle, which is the compiler, where to deploy and build the project. There are two versions of the build.gradle that you can have in your project. So when you import in this example project, it'll auto add the plugins for you. However, if you're doing a base project, which we'll go over later where we create a new project, you'll have to add these extensions manually. So if we go to the VMX extension here, you'll see there is a change the deploy target to VMX or change the deploy target to RoboRio. If you're using a RoboRio, you hit this, but we are on a VMX, so we want to change the deploy target to VMX. And you can see at the bottom it says, your project is now configured for a VMX file. It'll then build the project again to make sure everything is good. If you wanna make sure to keep your, uh, your VMX up to date, you can hit VMX Pi, update WPI lib version. When you hit this, see I'm already at the current version. If you were not at the current version, it would download the current version and rebuild. And the next time you deploy to the VMX, it will download all the updates. Okay, so now that my VMX has booted up, I'm going to uh, show you how to connect. First off, you want to connect to the Wi Fi of the platform. For me, I have renamed it training uh, 1234. For you, your image on the VMX will come as world skills 1234 and it will be password protected. The password is password with no caps. Should be pretty simple. So when you connect, it might take some time, it might not. So we'll just let mine connect and then we will show you how to deploy. There we go. I'm now fully connected to the platform. Now I'm going to hit the WPI extension here. And as you can see, there is a, oh, we can't deploy robot code. We're gonna deploy the robot code. So I hit deploy and now it's gonna start deploying as we can see here. And now when this comes up, build successful, it means that I have successfully deployed my code to the VMX and my code is live. If I were to stop sharing here so you can see, if you look at the status light on the uh, Titan, if you notice the blue, green, red blink, it means that your code should be working because it's communicating between the, the VMX and the Titan. unplug the controller. So if you notice now, here is the shuffleboard in the background. Can you see it? Yep. Good. So the shuffleboard right now has nothing on it. Because if we remember in our code, in the training subsystem, when we did our shuffleboard stuff, 
we created a new tab called training. So if we look at Shuffleboard, there is a tab here called training. I'm gonna click on it. And now we can see some of the outputs that we created. So here's the sharp IR. Here's the servo position based on zero to 300. Our raw Cobra value, the servo speed if we're using continuous servo, the ultrasonic value, the Navex yaw, and the Cobra voltage. Right now our Cobra is responding with the full five volts voltage because it is over a dark surface. So if it was over a light surface, it would go down. Now, if you notice with the yaw, if I were to spin the, the let's switch over. Uh, and you can still see because we're on that camera. You can see the yaw value change based on the angle of it's changing. If I were to hold my hand in front of this sharp sensor, we can see the distance they are reported in centimeters. My hand is roughly the 15 centimeters away from the sharp sensor, as Derek can vouch for. 15.68. Yeah. So there we have the sharp value. The ultrasonic value won't work unless we have our enabled robot. So if I were to now go in here, make sure I'm in teleoperated mode and hit enable. Oh, I forgot that I changed my pins for my ultrasonic sensor. We can go over that later. So it won't report the right value. But if we look here, let me turn off my share. So if we look at the motor here, if I were to move the right axis on my controller Y, you can see a gear of the motor move. Also notice how the robot is enabled and the Titan is blinking purple. That means the robot's enabled. If I hit disable, notice how the lights now go back to blue, green, red. Now, if I move the right axis on the controller, the motor will not move because the robot is disabled. Let's, yeah, there's some questions. Okay. If I were to share my screen again, I can show you everything. So if you look here, I can see the voltage of my battery. So right now my battery is at 12.36 volts. So what is the default password for the password? No password. If I look at the joystick section here, we can see zero. If you remember back to the gamepad constants, our gamepad was set to zero. Now, if I wanted to move the servo, which we have plugged in there, if I enable the robot and I drive the slider, you can hear the servo move. So let me stop sharing so that you can see the servo. So the servo is right here. If you watch the horn on the servo, as I slowly move the slider, we can see the servo move. If I move this, the slider from one end to the other end really quickly, we can see it move the full range. And it's as simple as that. Let's share again. So now if we notice, my ultrasonic's not working because I changed the port value of what it's in. So what do we do now to fix that? Let's go back to our VS code, which is in the wrong, there we go. So now here back in our VS code, where was our ultrasonic sensor defined? If we remember, it was in constants.java. So if we look here, I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna go down sensors, sonic trigger and sonic echo. So right now I showed that I have an eight and nine. However, I switched mine over to ports 10 and 11. 
this was to help out someone yesterday who was, couldn't get their ultrasonic sensor working. So let's change. My trigger is on 10 and my echo is on 11. So I'm going to switch it like that. Now hit save. And I'm going to redeploy the code to the robot. As you can see now, it's re rebuilding and then it's going to deploy the code to the VMX. And now we can see that we have connected to the VMX again. If I hit enable, we can see the ultrasonic sensor giving us the data in millimeters. As I am, based on what's here right now, if I were to hold my hand here, you can see I'm about 100 millimeters from where the sensor is. If I get closer, it gets smaller. If I get farther away, it gets farther. So we can see the sensor now working and we're happy. If I hit disable, it will stop because the ultrasonic sensor will only work in this enabled mode, whereas the other sensors can work outside of that. So if I had a white object, too thick, too thick right there in front of you. White paper, oh, and then we'll take a break. Yeah. So now, if I hold this white paper over the Cobra sensor, hopefully we can see the value change. It doesn't matter. So if we notice now, I put a white piece of paper underneath where the Cobra line follower is. As we see, the voltage has changed to 0 0.6 volts, and the raw value is 249. That's because if you remember what Derek said before, is that when the sharp set, I mean, when the ultrasonic, ugh, <laughs> when the Cobra sensor is over a white value, it will report a low voltage. However, when it's over a darker value, it will report a higher voltage. So in this case, we're reporting a low voltage as we're over a white surface and the raw value is low. If I were to remove the, the tape, we can see it jump up to five volts. In a, in a max raw value. This is because we're now over a dark surface. And it's as simple as that. It's a very easy to use system. All right, um, so what, what we did here was we just called up a sample project. Um, we created that sample project um, to provide to, um, to everybody, okay? Um, just so that they have a, a, a general idea of how all the subsystems work, okay, um, within the robot. And what you can do is you can build your whole project with that and have different subsystems for testing. So I think if you see James' screen, you'll see he's got his, his training subsystem, he's got his live robot subsystem, okay. But he's making use of all that code um, within one project, right. Uh, so it makes it nice and nice and easy once you get familiar with everything. Um, we'll start smaller in the next couple of days and then uh, uh, progress up from there. Um, so why don't we take a break until it's 10.08, let's do um, 10.20, okay? Um, we'll just go over some of the questions James and I that I, that I answered that he answered um, so that we can give some people a little more explanations. Um, so we'll see everybody at uh, 10.20. Oh, well, also, when we come back, we will show you how to remote into the VMX itself right? for you to see the Raspbian uh, area. How, you also had SSH in if you want to, all of the above. Right, because somebody had asked how to connect um, what the password was, so we'll cover that. Yep. Yeah, okay, see everybody at 1020.
stop it. Somebody's in the chat. Hi, Frank. Okay, uh, if everybody can uh, can hear me and see me, uh, for some reason, one of our systems just rebooted. So we're just getting uh, hooked back up again. Uh, we'll get the main host for today, which was James, uh, re-promoted re, uh, again, uh, and we'll get all set up and ready to go. Okay, um, welcome back everybody. Um, there was a couple of questions in the uh, chat uh, that are very, very relevant, okay? Um, one has to do with the driver workstation that James was running to enable and disable the robot. Um, we um, have a specific version that we're working on just for world skills that gets rid of um, some of the overhead on that. So that does not install um, when you're gonna use your VS code, we will distribute that um, to teams uh, separately. We're just running some tests because we wanted to make it easier for teams to install and everything was good until Derek installed it on his system last night and um, the language changed. So it might just be my system, but we just want to double check. Um, Aaron had asked a question about the, um, the Sharp IR cable. So some of the Sharp IR cables uh, got mixed up a little bit. So your Sharp IR cable have you, as you have it now, and you know, being the uh, awesome guy that you are, Earhart, you actually looked at the documentation, so you would notice that these two pins here uh, were backwards. Okay, so you have to, if you've got this version with the one triple Dupont connector, just check your pin out. You can just use a little screwdriver and push that out and swap those two pins. Okay, some of you may have the new cable, and the new cable you don't have to worry about it because. You know, for your flexibility, we, we split all the cables out so that you've got one, two, and three, okay? So if you got an issue with that, just send me a note and, uh, and let me know and we'll get, that, uh, we'll get that set up for you, okay? You can get over there and tell me anything else. And I'll just get James remade a host and we'll be good to go. Okay, so to solve that raspy and tool chain error, what you're going to do is let's share the screen. Okay, so in your VS code, you're going to hit Control Shift P to bring up the show all commands. We're then going to choose run a command in Gradle. So with, and then you're going to enter the command install Raspbian toolchain. Hit enter, and it will. It should install the toolchain. Uh, you have to make sure that you connect to the internet when installing the tool chain, otherwise it won't. It'll fail. Oh, oh it's because I already have it installed. Correct. Good. 
Yeah. Uh, if that doesn't work, what you can do is you can, uh, you should be able to do it from command. Yeah, you can do that. We had, we had this discussion yesterday about um, error messages that get uh, when you write code um, and how they should be a little bit more um, easily understandable. Uh, people just write stuff and write generic error messages. I know I've had a lot of problem dealing with students in the last two weeks because they get this error message that says unable to process command. And what that basically means is you've already installed this software. I can't install it again uh, because they weren't paying attention and, and watching this. Group. So yeah, I like little error messages. It's very, very interesting. Going. We're just going to get this uh, this reinstalled. So we're, was that the which connection was that? The BNH or the other? Because you already, uh, have, I already have installed. You already have installed. You get the error message continues. Yeah. So, yeah. So just show them how to host it. Otherwise, it's just going to it. Yeah, we will post later to the docs page how to install the tool chain properly if you're still having issues. Um, so right now we're going to show how to VNC into the robot. The first thing is I have to turn the robot back on. Connect. I'm just waiting to connect to the uh, VMX so that I can show you how to remote in. Now that we're connected, I'm going to share a screen. So to remote into the uh, VMX, we're going to use the VNC viewer. So the address for the VMX is 10.12.34.2. So if we look at the our Wi-Fi here. If you notice, mine says training dash one, two, three, four. The one, two, three, four is the team number that's assigned to the VMX. So in your case, it's world skills dash one, two, three, four. So the one, two, three, four is important. So if we look here, we have 10.12.34.2. As you can tell, the one, two, three, four corresponds to the one, two, Three, four. So if I had a number of 10, so if my thing here was world skills dash 2164, here I'd have 10.21.64.2. So to connect, let's type in 10.12.34.2. Oh, I'm already connected, so let's uh, delete this so we can show you that again. So I'm going to hit connect. It's not going to come up and asking for a username and password. This is the default SSH uh, username and password for the Raspberry Pi. So the username is Pi. The password is Raspberry. And if we look at it, you have Raspberry. We didn't remember password if you want. Hit OK. And we're now connected to the Raspberry Pi by remoting in. So this will be especially uh, useful if you are at competition and you're not allowed to hook your Pi up to a monitor or you don't have a keyboard and mouse laying around. You can easily remote into the Raspberry Pi. So one cool thing is I'm just going to show the camera module here. 
take the cap off. So let's go to terminal. So here's the terminal. I'm going to first. So I first need to uh, turn off the robot manager in order to display the camera on the Raspberry Pi. So we can do Raspberry So. Uh, just have to remember the commands you said. So I don't remember the commands you said. What do I do? Oh, I'm going to head on over to the doc stage, the docs uh, page. So here on the docs page, I'm gonna go down to VMX and you can see here, configuring and testing the XR Pro camera. This is already done. So we're gonna call this command. So raspy still dash, dash o dot desktop image. So if I bring up here again, let's do raspy still dash o desktop dash we're not going to take the image. Oh, and now we see there's an image created on the desktop. So if we open the image, we can see, hey there, it took a picture using the camera on here. And as you can see, it's taken the uh, full uh, HD picture, as you can see here, so 3280 by 2464, and it's flipped. So we can later reflip this in code, but now we're just going to leave it like this. And that's just to show you one way of connecting to the VMA. Now, if we wanted to set the uh, Wi-Fi to a different Wi-Fi. We use uh, certain commands that we built into the robot manager, such as set up Wi-Fi kind of SH. If I were to run this, it will then set up the VMX to connect to the internet. Right now, it's a wireless access point, so it does not connect to the internet. But I'm not going to run that. If I say set up Wi-Fi 8p.sh, it'll now set up a Wi-Fi access point. But we want to add some parameters. So the first parameter, so to do add a parameter, you hit space. So I'm going to say world skills. One, two, three, four. Password. So if we look at this, our first parameter is world skills. Our second parameter is one, two, three, four. And our last parameter is password. If we remember back to the Wi-Fi here, so training would correspond to world skills. One, two, three, four would correspond to the one, two, three, four. And then password is if I want to set a password. Right now, there is no password on my connection. However, if you want to add a password, you could put password. So when you receive your Raspberry Pi, sometimes it's a good idea to remote in and then change this. So if I was Team Canada, for example, I could change this to Team Canada. And then let's give it a, a different number. So let's say 2000. And I want to add a password, Beaver. And then I hit enter and it will create a wireless access point with the SSID of Team Canada-2000. 
and the password will be beaver. However, I don't want to create a password because I'll lose the connection over VNC. So I'll just leave it. And now we know how to remote into the Pi to have a look. Now, if we wanted to view where the code actually goes for the robot, you'll notice there's another user here called LV user. And then there's a user called Pi. If we go to the LV user folder, we can see all the different stuff that's given to the Pi for the robot manager. So if you notice here, this is FRC trainer old command. You have java.jar, and then there's the new command.jar. These are three different VS Code projects that I have deployed to the training robot. If you go back to our VS Code, we called ours java.jar. Okay, so that's this right here. And then in the deploy, there's no, because that's a specific folder where you can send stuff from VS Code to be sent here. So here's our actual program that the robot manager will run on boot up of the robot that when we can drive our robot around. Very simple indeed. If you look here at the very top, if I were to hover over the Wi-Fi access point area, you can see that our what our IP address is, which is 10.12.34.2. And then our Etherlink is down because we don't have the Ethernet cable plugged in. So you then see that our VNC server is in service mode right now. The Bluetooth is on. You can turn that off if you want. Um, you can go into the Raspberry Pi config, change your preferences if you wanted to, uh, whatever you wanted to do. One thing to note is that in Raspberry Pi config, uh, your host name and your password should not change. If you change your host name and password, the robot side on VS Code will not be able to deploy to the robot. Oh, don't change any of this stuff. Just leave it as it is. In interfaces, you'll notice everything is enabled. So camera, SSH, VNC, SPI, I2C, and the serial port, we want all of that in here. We notice the serial console, the one wire, and the remote GPIO are disabled. These are disabled for a reason and should stay disabled. And these are all enabled for a reason and should stay enabled. So leave them as enabled. If you go to performance, you can see you have GPU memory. Right now we have it set to 128 as by default. You can increase this if you want, as if you remember, there are four gigabytes of memory on the Raspberry Pi. And there's plenty enough to increase this if you want, if you want your camera to operate better, along with when you are running your code. Okay, so let's shut this down. And you can see we have now lost connection. So hopefully that's answered some questions of how to deploy and connect to your VMX when required. Yeah, tomorrow when we do our individual um, sensor data and go over that code in the projects, um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll deploy uh, once again. So we'll get some, some uh, practice at this, okay? Uh, and looking at it to, from from different standpoints so that you can do that uh, when you go forward. Okay, it won't uh, won't be too difficult for you. Right. Like I said, this is meant to be a, an overview today, um, quick introduction to Java and how to connect to the the controller and so on. All right. Um, just remember that that um, everything is um, in there is is Pi based. Um, and it is open source, but there are settings that are preset, okay, that allow us to properly communicate using that as part of the control system. So as James said, there are certain items in there, um, don't touch or move, because if you change default access passwords, you're going to shut down your robot, okay? So, you know, my suggestion is, is that if you're using this in your environment and you're going to use it for things outside of world skills, 
just make sure you keep one that is set properly um, with the default the default image and everything is is good to go. Um, you know, don't mess around with it too much if you don't understand how to go back in um, and to make those changes because you don't want to do that um, and affect something at a critical junction, right? Okay, and uh, that's one of the key concerns that you can, you can have when you're going to do it. So it's based, it is open source, but you know we're providing you a lot of sample libraries and ways to access it. And if you mess it up, then you know those defaults are not going to work anymore, and it could make us troubleshooting that for you just a little bit difficult from our end to try to duplicate it. Okay. All right, was well, there anything else we needed to go over today? Okay, so we'll be done probably around um, 15 minutes um, early today. Uh, you know, what I would suggest is that if you, you have time and you haven't used Java before, take a look at some of the um, online Java tutorials, okay? Um, there's something called, James can put it in the chat if he wants, um, W3 Schools that you can look at online. Um, that uses uh, an online simulator, so you don't even have to install an IDE. And uh, we've used something called Code Academy in the past. Um, they have a fairly good little um, introduction to Java course. So, you know, spend some time doing that. We're a bit quick because, you know, sometimes what we do in a classroom environment on this is we actually give you a, uh, an assignment to do and we make you do those tests. Um, we're not doing those for you right now. So um, if you plan on three hours, you got 15 minutes left, um, get yourself into some, uh, into some Java, watch a few videos uh, and so on and so on as we go through. So by default, the uh, Wi-Fi host is set up as 2.4 gigahertz. Okay. However, you can switch it to five gigahertz manually, but you'd have to go in and change it. Right, so the question was, do, is the Wi-Fi set up in five gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz? Okay. Um, by default, it's at 2.4, uh, and you can go in manually. Um, you can change that to 5 gigahertz, okay? Um, next question is, uh, when will the C++ code be uploaded? Probably next week. And, I get to and I would think that, and what you mean is the complete project, correct? So we'll probably um, upload that live, uh, the complete project, uh, for next week. We just wanted to make sure we created this project. Um, for this training in the Java, but if you want it in C++, um, we're probably looking at next week. So just uh, bounce us a message and we'll make sure you're on the list and we'll get you the complete, uh, the complete project for that as well. Okay. All right. Um, we'll stay on for a few minutes. There's still 47 people there. Um, if there's any more chat questions and we'll try to help you out. Um, other than that, uh, we will see you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. our time. And we'll talk about the sensors and interfacing to each sensor and each motor. So we'll break things down uh, more at an individual scale. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everybody.